Well, hey there, everyone. This is Dave DeBow with another episode of the Property Profits Real Estate Podcast. Today, zooming in all the way from the GTA from Toronto, we've got Ming Lim from Volition Property Group. How are you doing today, Ming? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. Trying to wash my hands thoroughly, stay clean, stay isolated. <laughs> That's right. As we're recording this, you guys, it's uh, the beginning stages of the Corona craziness. Um, so yeah, that's what's on everybody's mind and probably still is at the time you're watching this. So anyhow, let's focus on the good stuff, Ming. So first of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure, um, so I'm primarily a real estate investor. Uh, I started my life in student rental properties. Uh, I, I went to the University of Waterloo. I lived in a student rental. And I uh, thought, well, this is not too bad of an idea. <laughs> Got into it myself. Uh, was exposed to Rich Dad Poor Dad, and if uh, if you read that book, it's an it's an excellent beginner book, and it it got me started on the path. Uh, then started doing multifamily in Toronto, and now primarily investing in multifamily in Toronto. Very very cool. So yeah, that purple book has uh, changed. I mean, out of all of the people I've interviewed on this podcast, I'd say conservatively. 75% got their start or got a real kick in the butt from reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So you're in good company there. So when you say you started off with student rentals, so were you still in university when you did your first student rental? Um, so I was living with roommates. Uh, they were watching Oprah. They were watching, not me. <laughs> they were watching Oprah. <laughs> and uh, uh, Robert Kiyosa uh, Kiyosaki was on. And Rich Dad Poor Dad came up and I said, oh, this sounds really interesting. I picked up the book and I'm not a big reader, but I read through it in like 24 hours. It's a pretty easy and that one. Yeah. A pretty easy read. And it was mind blowing for me. Like I was just 21 at the time. I had no clue. And it was a complete mind shift. And two weeks later, um, I had my first property. Wow. Um, I had a little bit of money saved because I was working at the time. Uh, I, I just finished university, so a couple of, couple of months out, and uh, picked up. It was a semi-detached home, hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, five percent down. I mean, if anybody's in Toronto, those numbers are ridiculous. I think a garage costs more than that now. Um, so yeah, that was that was that was the first thing. It was all wrong though. It was it was illegal. <laughs> it was uh, there's a maximum number of people you can have. I had exceeded that. I didn't know anything back then but that that is what got me started very very cool so maybe we were talking a little bit offline before i press record here about what you and your group of companies are doing and it's it's very interesting because you talk about multifamilies and a lot of people when they think multifamily they're thinking a huge apartment building they're thinking, well okay i can see how ming's doing this in toronto because you know he and his investor partners probably have super deep pockets and they're probably buying 50, 100, 150 unit buildings, and that's how they're able to make things cash flow. Is that the case? That is uh, not the case. Okay. Um, so what, neither on the super deep pockets or on, or on the 50 to 100 uh, units, but, <laughs> but I could, I'm happy to dive into what we're, how we do it exactly. Yeah, yeah, so, so because I love this topic, because again, everybody assumes that markets like in Canada, markets like, Toronto markets like Vancouver, there's no way in heck you can make a single family home cash flow. However, it seems like you guys have found a way. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah. So I, what what started it all? Because I was in student rentals for a while, uh, and then my business partners. You know, we were we're all Rain alumni, and uh, you know, back back in the day, uh, Rain was fantastic place and it it was very much about going after cash flowing properties so you know i was in waterloo that aligned uh my partner matt he went to hamilton and he went to edmonton to invest because great cash flow there and then my other business partner sam he started investing in sudbury so here we are all toronto boys and we're investing all across uh, canada but you know one of the challenges was we were so cash flow focused, we lost perspective of the real return, like the real returns of real estate. And as we became a little more sophisticated, we started looking at just, you know, not just 
cash on cash return, but cash on mortgage pay down and cash on appreciation. And when we start to look at it holistically, the one or two properties we had in Toronto were far exceeding the returns that we had outside. And that's when we all had a, like individually had light, this light bulb moment. Why are we investing outside of our own backyard? Why don't we try to figure out a way to make it work here in Toronto? Uh, so as you alluded to, you can't just buy a house and rent it out or a condo and rent it out and cash flow. You're going to be losing significant uh, month to month. You'll be cash flow negative. So just, just so, to give people an idea, what at the time that we're recording this, what is the average price of a single family home and a condo in your area in Toronto? So I think I think I just saw the headline that the average home price is about nine hundred fifty thousand now in Toronto, but I would say that is low because that is looking at all the of Toronto. Um, so the areas that you want to invest in uh, that's actually quite a bit higher. So the properties that we're investing in these days are about one point two to one point three million. Uh, that's for, kind of for the, a house. For a house, yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, so you know because we had these, I guess this tenant profiles that were a little challenging. I had students, and I should back up. Students are not malicious in any way. They're just students. And, you know, taking care of the place and paying rent on time is just not on their mind. And, and it shouldn't be, right? Like, they're there to study. Um, so we wanted to rent to ourselves. Like, we were young professionals. We all had jobs at the time. And we were like, who's the best tenant profile? And, and it was us, right? We, we would starve and eat instant noodles for a month at a time rather than be late for, for rent. It's just, just something we would never do. Mm -hmm. So we, we started to take that tenant profile and work backwards from there. And it was, okay, where would we live? Uh, we were millennials at the time, right? Um, and so where would we live? And it was, well, we, we, we need to be close to our jobs. And we would give up like space, to be within that tw kind of 25 to 30 minute commute to the downtown core where you know, ourselves and all our friends worked. And so that really started to shrink the areas that we were investing in, which is why I'm saying 900,000 is fine if you include all the suburbs, yeah. but it's more like 1.2 when we start looking at the core of the city. Right. And um, you know, most people who are young professionals, they wanna live in condos, about 75% of them wanna live in condos, but there's 25% who are, and it's a growing number, who are interested in, I would say, neighborhoods with a little more character. So homes that have been nicely converted, they still have to be nice luxury uh, places, but have backyards, have walkable neighborhoods, uh, have a bit more personality. And that's the niche that we're going after. So it's a very specific uh, targeted demographic. Uh, so what we do is we, you know, we, we buy properties in these neighborhoods, uh, places like uh, Little Portugal, Little Italy, Corso Italia, along the Danforth. Um, homes about 1.2 to 1.3 million. And then we go through a legal conversion process. Typically, this is a legal triplex conversion. So uh, we're buying a property as run down as possible, not because we're trying to get major lift, but because in order for me to legalize it, I need to gut the entire house because right. we're putting in soundproofing, fire, you know, fire retardant materials, interconnected fire alarms, uh, HVACs uh, for each unit. Uh, like we have to do all these things anyway to legalize it. So there's no point in me keeping anything inside the house. Uh, so well, we go what's through this. Kind of the, what's kind of the vintage of the, of the kind of house you're typically buying? Um, old to very old. <laughs> like it's like uh, they're probably about 80 plus years to about 120 plus years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, because again, it also has to do with the size of those houses, right? I mean, those are those are some pretty large. They have to be pretty large to be able to turn them into a triplex. I'm guessing. Exactly. Um, so uh, there, there's a like I think it's a de development saying that moving dirt costs money, or never move dirt because you'll go bust or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's the case for us because if we start to have to underpin or you know do things to the foundation or extend properties. Our, our our price of renovation starts to escalate very quickly. Um, so, so we're looking for square footage. And I guess a, a question which probably comes to people's mind is, why don't you just bulldoze it and put up a purpose-built triplex in its place? That, and that, that's an excellent question. So, um, you know, with... there, I don't know if uh, your audience is familiar with development fees, but basically... 
uh, it's a fee that's levied by the city for new developments. And the development charge exists if I go from nothing to triplex, because okay. the, the way that the, the laws are set up is that, you know, we're putting up three units, therefore it's like a little apartment, therefore we must pay development fees. And those can be quite significant. They can kill your business case. It can be upwards of a hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, if we don't have to pay them, great. And the way that we avoid it, and it's not like some fancy loophole we found here, uh, is a stepped process. Uh, because the city had always intended development fees to be for like, you know, if you're putting up 200 units in a condo, yeah. then yeah, you, you are impacting the infrastructure significantly at that point. Um, but we take a stepped approach. So we first do it as a duplex. Uh, you can do most duplex renovations as of right, which means you don't need to go through committee of adjustments or things like that. We do it as a duplex, and then we move up to the triplex afterwards. So it is a bit of a longer approach uh, that probably adds about three to four months to our construction timeline. Okay. Uh, but in doing that, we avoid the hundred thousand dollar development charge. Which yeah, that that's significant for sure. All right. So just to recap, you're finding pretty large single family homes in these ideal neighborhoods close to the city center within a 20, 30 minute commute uh, to downtown. This, these are areas that are very, very attractive to upper mobile young professionals who don't necessarily want to live in a condo. They're looking for more of a, a home type feel. The, the more run down, the better for these kind of properties because basically you're gonna, you're not gonna demolish it, but you're gonna gut it. And let me, let me ask you this, Nick. So with these older homes are like 80, 100, 120 years old, they've got pretty good solid bones, don't they? I mean, they they built them to last back of the <laughs> So uh, it, it it to be to be quite honest, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Yeah. Um some of these older homes are built fantastically. Some of them aren't. Uh so I'll give you an example. Um we are doing a conversion right now for one of our clients. And this home was actually a stable at one point. So it's a, it's a, along King and Bathurst, and King is where all the on King was where all the homes were, and then the stables were at the back. So this this row of houses were actually stables, and because they were never meant for people to live in there, they were converted stables. They actually were not built to last. <laughs> So this property had a bit of a lean in the wall. Now we were able to crack the lean and fix the structure behind it, um, but it, it can be a bit of a mixed bag. And that's why, you know, when we're buying these places, we have to be very conscious of what we're buying. We knew there would there was a lean, like it's quite obvious when you see the property, mm -hmm. uh, but it's like how do you how do you remedy it, and can you get your money? Can you get a good price on it because it scares away a bunch of other people? Right. Exactly. All right. Well, that's okay. So you buy the property, you start the process of turning it into a duplex and then, but all the long, all the while you're planning, you're turning into a triplex, right? So, yes. how, so do we do how that? does that kind of work? <laughs> sure. So, you know, uh, the property itself, we're looking for a, a bunch of things. Uh, like I said, we don't. We want to do as little to the structure of the home as possible, and we want to focus instead on the things we have to do for triplex. Um, so ceiling heights are really important to us. Uh, a lot of, like, let's say older Victorians, they've got beautiful, you know, ten foot, twelve foot ceilings. Yeah, that is not easy for us to to in, enhance in any way. So if we can buy into that, great. Uh, basement ceiling heights is another one. Don't quote me on this, but I think it's we need 611 over 75% of the basement in order for us to have a legalized triplex in there. Okay. Uh, but basically, we have uh, height requirements that we need in the basement as well. And, and no NBA players living down there. No, we, you know, on the on the rental, it's like you know, five foot five maximum. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we, we we have like height requirements we need to to meet. Assuming we've found a property with all those things. Uh, we, we open up a duplex permit. So, you know, we have architects and engineers that we work with to create the plans. We submit it to the city. And then when we talk to our inspectors, we are transparent. We don't, we're not trying to hide anything from the city because we need them to be a partner in all this. The city is trying to densify as well. Yeah. Toronto has, you know, we have 
less than 1% vacancy on the secondary market, which is investors like us. It's ridiculous right now if you're a renter. So it's not in their interest to be difficult for densification. They just want to make sure that we're building a safe place and we're building it to code and we want the same thing too. Right. So we tell them, hey, we've got this duplex permit, but our intention is to make it a triplex evaluate us under those criteria because you're going to be the inspector that's here hopefully when we submit for triplex permit so if we need additional fire separation for this hot light or this hvac on this floor because right now it's just duplex but it will be triplex let us know now you know we have the expertise ourselves to know where we need that kind of fire separation but at the end of the day the inspector the inspector's god when it comes to uh, renovations whatever they say goes mm -hmm. so it, some inspectors want it done a particular way some may want it done differently uh, so we do engage them from the very start so that way we have that conversation with them nice so main time flies when we're having fun so to kind of wrap up this this idea so we get our head around it you're buying for 1.2 you're taking her down to the studs it sounds like so mm -hmm. typically let's say you buy for 1.2 what are you putting into it for renovations? So renovations uh, look all in. So this is renovation. This is holding architecture soft soft costs. Yeah. We're probably looking at about anywhere between four hundred to five hundred thousand. They're expensive renovations, yeah, no doubt. I would imagine. Um, the nice thing about Toronto is you can have a house on the same street, one selling for a million dollars, one selling for two million dollars. And in the neighborhoods that we're doing this in, we need that because we need the high ARV. Uh, you know, after we've done the renovations to refinance and get our money back. This is nothing more than a complicated burr strategy for us, but we get them rented out uh, and then we refinance and rents in these kind of places are pretty good. Anywhere between about 7,500, 8,000 for the, the property up to about 10,000 for, oh, for, for the three, for the, for the, for the three units. Right. Okay. Um, so we're, we're able to, you know, get these, property ARVs about $2 million, and then we have about 8,000-ish in rents. So you're still cash flowing after you're done too. So what, you know, without, because I can't do the math in my head, what are you cash flowing on that kind of a property after you've pulled your money out? Yeah, so cash flow, of course, it drops quite a bit after the, after yeah. the refinance. Uh, so you're not cash flowing much, maybe about 300, 400 bucks uh, afterwards. Okay. Um, but you're into a $2 million property with excellent tenants. This is another reason why we actually went to this model because it was easier for us to scale. One property generating 9,000, 10,000 bucks is like easier for us to scale than it is to have to manage 50 or hundred units, which is not, not our specialty. Like we're not property managers. Yeah, yeah. That's the part that actually I, I hate the most <laughs> in real estate investing, but, um, but it was easier for, it's easier for us to scale. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Main time flies when we're having fun. We'll have to have you back on the show to kind of dig a little bit deeper into this. But if people want to find out more about you and and Volition Group, what should they do? Uh, so best thing, you can check out our website. So it's uh, www.volition, that's V-O-L-I-T-I-O-N, prop, P-R-O-P dot com. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. So it's uh, at Investor Ming. Uh, and feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can email me directly, uh, ming at volitionprop.com. And I think if, you're, if people are in the GTA, I think you guys run a very, very established and successful meetup group as well. Is that correct? Yeah, we're about uh, 2,000 members now. Um, and we've been doing it for four years, five years. Man, I, I don't know, a long time. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the name of your meetup group? Uh, I think it's... Toronto Real Estate Mastermind? Yeah. Go to our website. <laughs> All the links are on there. <laughs> Perfect. Ming, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, that's some really good tips on how to make a single family home cash flow in Toronto. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, Dave. My pleasure. All right, everybody. See you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Well, thanks very much for checking out the Property Profits podcast. And if you like what we're doing here, please head on over to iTunes, subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. Be very, very much appreciated. And if you're looking to create a regular flow of inbound investor inquiries about your real estate deals, then I invite you to attend one of my upcoming live online demonstrations. And you can check that out at 
investorattractiondemo.com. Take care.